Oh, hello. I'm here. I don't know if anyone else will be here because I barely remembered that I had to be here or that I said I was going to be here, but I'm here. We made it. We made it through April. I don't know how or what happened to April, but it's May. So I'm here to talk about the book club pick for April, which was Essential as such true by Diana Paxson. And I feel like that's all I've been talking about for the last month now to the point that it's in the autocomplete in my phone. Essential as such true by Diana Paxson. But um, I was actually surprised by how quickly I was able to make it through this book, especially compared to the first book that I had read by her a couple months ago when I first came into the faith, which was her book on Odin. Uh, I can't remember the full title. It's like Odin, Ecstasy, Runes, and Magic or something like that. But yeah, it was her book more specifically on Odin. And that one was really good. Um, I also would highly recommend that one as well. But that one I found was just a little bit more dense. Um, there was just like a lot more like densely packed with information and stuff about Odin and elaborating on him and his whole background and, and things like that. So that one took me a lot of time to get through and was a lot to absorb. So I kind of expected a little bit more of the same going into this one. And so for me, I don't know if it was because I'm like already, you know, a little bit, almost a, almost two years into the faith. Hi, Rachel. Um, I'm almost like two years into being, you know, practicing Norse pagan or whatever you want to call it now. So I don't know if it's because I had just already been doing a lot of reading and research before I even picked up this book. So I ended up finding this one a lot uh, more digestible and easier to get through than her Odin book personally. So I, I made it through this one, um, way before the end of the month somehow. So it might take me a minute to actually kind of get back into it because I've been pretty busy, actually. Just got back from a little small pagan Beltane gathering over the end of April and, like, first weekend of May. So that's why we kind of couldn't do the book club discussion, like, right at the beginning of the month like I usually try to. But I'm here. We, like I said, we made it. I'm pretty sure I had a sonic beverage in the last live stream, so that just shows you how much of a creature of habit I am. So yeah, um, I did really enjoy this book, and I would definitely recommend it if you're someone who is still kind of a beginner like me, and especially if maybe you don't have um, really any any knowledge of, you know, okay, I'm kind of interested in these gods or in this faith, but where do I start from? And this kind of gives you a really good, like, basis and jumping off point. So, so yeah, I would definitely recommend this to anyone who is kind of a beginner, intermediate level, just getting into things, um, because it definitely serves as just a really good primer for as a true, um, like kind of just the essential common beliefs and tenets and gods and practices that you might find in a modern day pagan, Norse pagan, heathen community. Um, and so I, I know of Diana Paxson from um, fantasy novels, actually, before I ever got, actually got into being a practicing pagan. She wrote and co-wrote a lot of prequel books to the fantasy novel The Mists of Avalon, which was kind of like the retelling of Arthurian legend, something I've also always been into. Um, and so they, she wrote a lot of prequel books set in that world, which really kind of delved further back into history during like the Roman occupation of Britannia. And so you kind of see some hints and elements of druidry and goddess worship incorporated in there. And so then when I got into Norse paganism 
and I found that she had also authored some nonfiction books on Norse paganism. And so that really kind of helped me to explain why some of that background and like practice of the whole witchcraft and magic aspect in her fiction books um, just felt so real and well researched to me back when I read those. Um, and so now it's kind of cool to go into the nonfiction side and get even more of a background into all of that stuff that I'm into actually incorporating into my practice beyond just um, Norse paganism. Like I would definitely consider myself wanting to incorporate um, what would be labeled more of like the Celtic and Druid paths and practices as well. But this is definitely focusing more specifically on not just Norse paganism, but Asatru. And so what I, from what I was just kind of able to find um, when I delved into Diana Paxson herself after finding her books, is that she is also um, the head of a modern day pagan religious organization known as the Troth. And from what I've been able to glean, and like I'm, like I said, I'm just kind of a total newbie when it comes to that whole aspect of things. I'm pretty much still a solitary practitioner for the most part. I've gone to a few pagan gatherings, but nothing as so big or so formal as like the troth or anything like that. So she does kind of provide these interesting little introductory um, blurbs or scenarios, storylines, if you will, that kind of carry through each chapter as though you were present at a modern day gathering of heathens and what practices and what types of people you might find at such an occasion. But it's definitely from that more structured already point of view, um, like not to compare apples to oranges too much, but um, Asa True and like some of the more formal Asa True and formally recognized organizations like the Troth have been around since I think at least the the 70s, if not earlier. Um, and so, and some of them, um, you know, kind of died and split and came back to life and rebranded and all that fun, crazy stuff. But I would almost compare it in a way to like modern day Wicca in that sense of it's been very ritualized and formalized. You know, there are group rituals which are ideally performed together in group settings and not just solitary. And um, it was very structured in like the types of oaths that they would make and the way that they would go about making the oaths. She kind of talks about having the ritual symbol where, which I actually thought was kind of a cool idea where you pass the drinking horn around three times um, and once is for like the gods and then once is for the ancestors and then once just kind of toast whoever, you know, folk, family, whatever, whoever else you want to give your props to. Yeah, the toast boats and oaths. So I, th I definitely thought that was kind of cool. Um, that was something that we actually did at one of the first gatherings I attended um, where Zach, the fellowship leader, had kind of had us go around and do that. So um, you will see that incorporated elsewhere. And that's not, so that was something interesting to see. But but yeah, they kind of do have more um, from at least from, you know, the way she presents it in this book or from just what I've been able to find. You know, people can all obviously correct me if they've actually attended these types of things and I'm wrong. But it kind of made it seem like there were more official recognized roles, like not a priest and a priest, like a priesthood, but but formal kind of recognized clergy people designated to to lead the rituals and kind of host the gatherings, if you will. Um, kind of maybe like the the ancient um, Gothi, Icelandic Gothi would, where they maybe weren't performing a role as a clergy full time year round, but they were the designated person who would assume that role when it was that time of year. I don't know, but but yeah, it was interesting to kind of see those little scenarios sprinkled in 
amongst the actual informative chapters. So, so we can kind of just go through it here. Um, I've done my little, you know, earmarking and highlighting as usual of just different things that I thought were cool or wanted to talk about. Um, because, you know, she kind of opens by saying that heathenry, much like other, you know, animistic or pagan religions, is based on traditional values and the tryout of the gods, ancestors, and the land, which I definitely think is true. Um, those are definitely the big three that you will see or that I have seen revered and honored at the gatherings that I have been able to attend so far. Um, I'm still still kind of working on incorporating ancestor practice myself, but you know, baby steps. We get there when we get there. Everything in good time. Um, but yeah, so like I said, this just kind of serves as a really good basic primer. She goes into just kind of some definitions of words like heathen and pagan and what they actually, you know, meant back in the day during the time when Christianity was starting to take hold because, you know, that's just really where the word pagan and heathen come from is just the people that didn't live within, you know, the civilized city walls and partake in that whole society or partake in either the Roman gods or the Christian gods or whatever gods were, you know, the the gods to worship at the time. Um, so they were the heathens, the people who just lived out on the heaths and did what they wanted. Then she also... Um, kind of just has a brief statement on who this book is for, which, like I said, um, is an introduction to heathen faith and practice. And so it was definitely really interesting for me when I had brought this book to work and uh, just had it sitting out on my desk and someone, co-worker, happened to stop by to chit-chat and was like, oh, at, at, is that true? What's that? And I was like, oh, um, I'm just really into Norse mythology and learning about how people lived in different societies back in the day, you know, history buff over here, that's me. But, you know, it is kind of interesting to see um, that it does kind of delve into the history of heathenry, just talking about what people might have believed in or practice in the North and in Scandinavia before the takeover of Christianity. And so just a, just, yeah, just a, a good job giving a pretty brief but informative overview on kind of the history leading up through those prehistoric ages goes through the Bronze Age. Ooh, I thought this was interesting. Um, talks about peoples who, uh, you know, the whole pie thing, Proto-Indo-European peoples living in Anatolia and on the steppes, which I was watching a really interesting video the other day about the Trojan War and delving into kind of the actual history and archaeology behind that and looking at some of the Anatolian and Hittite texts and how it might have matched up with and being references to the actual Trojan War and to Troy. Um, and so this is kind of that same area of like Turkey and the steppes of kind of Asia there and how those people might have ended up migrating west and meeting with the more like northern and baltic peoples hey aruna Woo, i actually have people in here for once even though i did a really bad job like <laughs> with my social media advertisement leading up to it this weekend like i was sitting on the couch just chilling just chilling with my boo and you know having a sunday fun day and then looked at the clock and was like oh shit i'm supposed to be going live on youtube here in like 20 minutes yo but like I said, we made it. We're here. Hello. Yeah, I'm really, I'm really glad that you guys are here because I'm, I have some thoughts and some hot takes on this, on this book 
to be real with you, and I can't wait to get to them and see you guys' opinions on it because it's very informative, and then it also kind of glosses over a lot of things when it comes to the modern-day Norse pagan heathen community, because it's like, don't get, a, get me wrong, I like Diana Paxson, and I like her fiction and her nonfiction work. I thought this book was, like I said, very good, very informative, but from what I know of the background of some of these older modern day Norse pagan and heathen religions, I thought she could have done um, a much better job of calling some of that shit out, to be honest, but whatever. That's not really what we're here for, but ooh, ooh, Rachel, you'll appreciate this here. So yeah, we were talking about um, the original proto-Indo-European homeland here in Central Asia that she was touching on here when she's going into the history section of the book, um, the whole Kurgan migration hypothesis theory, and um, yeah, legends in which a warrior band subjugates and rules a larger population found all across that Indo-European area, which is definitely um, reminiscent of things like the Aesir Vanir War. Like I said, the, the Trojan War, um, the War of the Tuatha de Danu, the war between the Suras and Devas, um, you know, all that shit. And not to mention, this was also the area where our favorite Gobekli Tepe was built. So people have been living and doing shit there for a long time. Just saying. Um, and then I, yeah, she also makes an, a note here, like shout out to my Vayner Vibes people that uh, in both the Romance and Germanic languages, which the Romance languages are the languages descended from Latin, um, so like French and Spanish and Italian. And then, but in both the Romance and Germanic languages, the word for cow became the root for terms having to do with wealth. And the first warfare was often the cattle raid, which yeah, all the Irish ballads and epics are about cattle raids. And then we know that, you know, the Hindu people to this day still revere the cow. And then I also thought it was interesting that she notes that the Germanic languages in particular include a certain percentage of words, especially those having to do with the sea that seem to have come from another language group, indicating a fusion of the incoming culture with that of an earlier population. Vonir cult, just saying, they, the Vonir seem to especially be the ones that were kind of like native to that area and having to do with the sea and whatnot. So I thought that was really cool, yeah. And then it says, you know, just kind of talks about the basic um, societal structure and things that you'll kind of see referenced in like Germania in terms of like social structure and things like that. Um, she also kind of briefly touches here on um, things like Georges Dumézil, who assert that the tripartite social structure goes back to the Indo-European culture and that each of their gods fulfills one of three functions. Um, and so I feel like you do kind of see that in Norse paganism as well. Like their big three were usually Odin, Thor, and Freyr. Um, and so, or like what I, the way I kind of view it in modern day is, um, you know, in Hindu, it's um, Rama, Vishnu, Shiva, creator, preserver, destroyer. And I think the Norse gods can definitely kind of fulfill those roles as well. Um, and then you also, what I think in kind of like modern day practice could view it as, is you have like the warrior, the shaman, and the king. So just some things to think about that I think, I so I think that, um, you know, definitely historians and scholars and people who actually know what they're talking about would probably argue and tell you different, um, that, you know, not every religion can kind of fit into that tripartite structure, but, but I think you can find a, or make your own little triads there and, and fill in the blanks with Norse deities as well. I think like Odin is definitely the creator and Thor especially definitely acts um, as a preserver. I think Freyr does as well, kind of preserves and maintains. And then um, everyone's favorite Loki boy would be the Shiva, the destroyer, so.
Um, and then she also does note that just like we had um, that proto-Indo-European god who a lot of the other gods, their names, you can trace it back to this root of Dios, um, Deus, Deus Peter, Jupiter, Zeus, Tyr, a lot of those guys go way back. Um, and we do have evidence that, you know, before Odin kind of took over as the primary god of like kings and poets in the upper echelons that um, Tyr might have fulfilled that role more commonly. You know, but I think it also could have been like a regional thing as well. Um, and then she also notes that deities of the earth included a god of the waters beneath the earth, who was also the ancestor of fire. Um, and I think in my book, not my, not my book, my video that I did about like Odin and Loki, two sides of the same coin, I noted how I also found a lot of aspects in common with the two of them and the Slavic god Welles, who also, from what the little I was able to find and just kind of glean on him, represented kind of that boundary realm um, and that duality. And then, um, from what I've been able to read about like Greek culture and practice, like before the Olympian pantheon really took over, um, like there was kind of this God who was kind of a prototypical God of both like earth, water and fire, almost like Poseidon is the God of like waves, but also earthquakes and kind of almost uh, fulfilled a dual role that, that was later shared with Hades. I don't know. I'm digressing, but it's it's interesting. And then she also notes um, notes the moisture mo mother, which I think would definitely be represented by Nerthus, the goddess of life giving earth. Um, and her name that and her name provided the root word that eventually evolved into our word for humanity. Hmm, interesting. And then I think in Egyptian you had like Newt and Tefnut. There was like a moisture goddess in, in the creation myth there as well. Yeah, I think there is definitely, and it's, it's kind of weird uh, now that you mention it, Runa, because like at first that was kind of a lot of both what drew me to Wicca, but also kept me from getting fully into it was I liked the triple goddess. Um, and now it's more like, when I first came into Norse paganism, I definitely kind of had more of that like Hindu mindset of pantheism where it's like, oh, like it's the many aspects of the one and it's just all different facets of the same being that we can relate to and, comp and comprehend on a human level. And then uh, you actually start working with all these deities and they're like, oh, but they're really distinct individual personalities though. So... While I don't really think that it's like a triple-faced goddess, I can definitely see like Freya friggin' hell being my personal triad there of like maiden mother crone. So she kind of just goes on from there, given the history of kind of the Viking age and all of that, the great mi migrations and how all of these tribes of Germania and Gaul just, and people moving in from the East once the Huns started becoming big. And um, it's interesting because I actually did just finish reading a fiction book by Diana Paxson called The Raven and the Wolf. Um, and it's actually her retelling of the Volsung saga. And so you had the characters of Sigmund or whoever, whatever his name is, and Brunhilde, the Valkyrie. And so she kind of touches there. Um, she kind of takes the more historical supposed bases for those tales and tries to fit it in with this great migration period. Yeah, Siegfried, the interaction between the Huns and the Burgunds, which gave rise to the great Germanic legend story of Siegfried, or Old Norse Sigurd, and the treasure of the Nibelungs. So that was kind of interesting to see her kind of delve into a little bit more in depth 
in the historical background here when I had just finished reading her fictional account of the same events. And then chapter three is from Vikings to Vinland, talking about the Viking age itself. Um, and then, so my first little note here is under Hoff and Hall on page 32 in the sagas, someone who has a deep devotion to one of the gods is known as Thorsvin or Freysvin, the friend of Thor or Freyr. This way of referring to the relationship seems typical of the Norse attitude toward their gods. Rather than coming to the gods as manipulators or supplicants, the heathen approached his deities as an ally. Like, yeah, they're just like their friends. Um, maybe not so much Odin, like kind of like I said in my review of the Northmen, when you want to work with Odin, you also sometimes find yourself working for Odin. But other than like, especially the Vanir and like Thor, I don't, I don't work very closely with Thor myself, but from everything I have seen and heard and even just experienced myself, he is very responsive. I kind of consider him like the everyman of the gods, like the most down, literally down to earth because he's the protector of Midgard. So he is the most down to earth God, like um, especially of the Aesir, you know, like he's the one that's just, he's, he is everyone's bro. Like not to get too much into the whole like brusat, bro satru cliche, but like Thor is just everyone's bro. He's down to bro out. And and then, yeah, like the Vanir especially are just so approachable. And like I think next to Odin or Thor, like the other big one that I hear being the one that brings people into this faith is Freya. And so I think the Vanir especially are just so laid back and friendly and approachable and want, want us to be happy. So, so I thought that was cool. You could be, call yourself a Thorsvin or Freyrsvin. And then um, she also does kind of go into that point that I made where in Iceland there were like there were no full-time clergy and the term Gothi referred to the most notable man of that district to assume, just to whom others swore loyalty and he just represented them in council at the Althing. And um, that those who were friends of the gods might build a shrine to the deity and act as his priest for those who had need, but they were... Um, also just full-time farmers so like no one might like there might not be someone who just full-time was a clergyman or a priest and that was all they did but you would have that person who was just kind of like your elected representative <laughs> that to the gods just maybe you knew a guy who was just really in tight with Thor <laughs> so and he'd be the one you would go to for Thor stuff but, but yeah, it makes an important distinction here that I especially think does still need to be maintained um, in modern day practice and what I appreciate about it over like Christianity or more organized religions is that intervention by a priest is not necessary to seek the gods nor was everyone required to honor them. In fact, some warriors preferred to trust to their own strength instead and people honored all the gods or one or none. Like that wasn't like just one set rote dogma or way of thinking, you know, even um, back then you would have gone to a meetup at the solstice and found people who like were there to honor Freyr on that day. But like, other than that, they just really didn't talk to him or didn't work with him or they were like, just someone who might call on tear in battle. And other than that, um, they didn't really worship any gods. They were too busy farming and living their lives. And that's what I really keep saying about modern day pagan um, practice is that it's not a religion. It's just a lifestyle. It's just a way of living, just a way of thinking and being. Yeah, I think that's definitely one thing that's very important to hold on to and keep in mind is to just not let it get too restrictive and too dogmatic. 
Do, do. Ooh, another cool thing that I liked that she noted here and made a comparison to is that the Old Norse understanding of the Vaitir or the White seems to have been very similar, as I've been saying, to what follower, followers of Shinto religion mean by Kami. Um, and so it's just this otherworldly spirit or being associated with or is manifested by a place or a situation. Um, and that essentially, you know, with animism, anything that has an identity can have a spirit. And so most common in the lore are the spirits of the land. But yeah, and uh, she also does make note that there were spirits associated, um, I think, even in like the Roman times with like the oracles and the dryads and the nymphs and everything. Um, and even in like the Celtic, there were different spirits for rocks, rivers, waterfalls, and then the beings who dwell in houses, barns, and then it's, she even specifies here mines and ships, which I think is definitely something that is a holdover today. Um, and then another interesting thing to note here is that um, she notes that ancient naming conventions are rarely precise and whites may also be referred to as dwarves or elves. So I'm like, is she kind of, is she saying that land spirits, elves, and dwarves are all the same. Um, maybe that argument could be made because you, especially with Snorri, you have like the light elves, which were more like airy realm nature spirits. And then the dwarves or Svart elves were more like earthly underground earth spirits. Um, but they all still fell into that realm of like not quite divine order, but just still an otherworldly being. Um, and then also makes note that in, in Norse practice, specifically Alfar also could be male ancestral spirits, just like Deesir is female. Um, and it's also interesting here that she says ancestors might also become spirits of the land. According to one theory, the Armander or harvestmen who guarded the home field was the spirit of the first man to till that piece of land. Um, and when I kind of went into my like altars versus shrines thing and talked about like the Lares versus Penates, I think that's kind of an interesting um, illusion there. And I can't, I can't believe I forgot to also mention like land spirits in the Alfar and Deesir in that video too, instead of just the Roman ones, because obviously like the Norse religion had their spirits of the land and the place as well but I thought that was interesting that she specified that like people and ancestors could also become like tied to a specific piece of land, which I definitely think it would be true, especially here, you know, in, in America, because people like settled their plot of land and like would have been the first person to till that piece of land and like might become very attached then to that piece of land especially if all of the ghost hunting shows I've watched are any indication. So then she talks about the conversion age, slow fall into Christianity, body blah, boo hiss. What's my next little note here? Now she did kind of touch briefly in that on what I call the whole elephant in the room of, you know, the revival of kind of nationalism and everything that happened in the early 1900s, World War One and World War II, when the Norse gods were, and like Germanic gods and ideals were kind of co-opted and corrupted by the good old Nazis. But I thought it was interesting that she also does say here that um, a lot of the, the things that Hitler also took from were not really from Germany so much as Imperial Rome. So like I said, he was just kind of picking and choosing what he wanted, just like people do today. Like Odin is the all father, he is not the some father. So you can have people nowadays who will just take 
anything and try to take it and co-opt it and corrupt it to support their own twisted agenda. And unfortunately, modern day Norse paganism is no exception. So she does talk here about that kind of like pagan revival when some of those first modern Asatru groups were first founded, um, which sadly today I would say from what I've been able to find, most of the ones she mentions here in this book, like I don't know when this was first published. This is two this is first printing two thousand and six. But most of the groups she names here I feel like are like the not good ones. I mean, let me know if I'm wrong, but the Odinist Fellowship is one that she mentions a lot, and she kind of keeps slipping in things here, like little things here and there, like, oh, this belief or, like, this ritual or this rite comes from the Odinist group. And then you go look them up on Google, and it's like, oh, nope, they're racist. Why did you include that one, Diana Paxson? Yeah, it has had several reprintings. So that's why I'm also kind of surprised that she didn't really touch on this stuff more um like was a big chunk of it here is like all of the history of paganism itself um and then yeah she kind of named some of the groups here that were founded um and then yeah in 1971 stephen mcnallan started the viking brotherhood which then became a Satru free assembly which then i think from what i just found on like wikipedia when i was first getting into this whole religion and trying to like figure out who the like acceptable sources of information like to me personally and don't get me wrong like I will still go and like read a book if I have like and I if I find out later that it's from someone that like has some not so PC up-to-date modern beliefs and you know living in our 21st century I might still finish that book and take information of it where I will but it's also just very important to know where your information is coming from um, and who that source is and what their own personal biases might be you just you need to be aware of what lens that information is being fed to you through and then use your good old critical thinking skills to make decisions for yourself on what you will take and accept into your own practice and what you won't. Because from what I was able to find, um, the Troth, the organization that she is a part of now, um, originally was part of like one of the big main groups back in the day, like a, either like a Satru Free Assembly or whatever they were calling themselves then. And then they kind of like, split off into the racist group which became like the AFA and then the troth which was like the inclusive one and so that luckily like that's the one that she's a part of but it's like yeah even with this book you gotta be careful and do your research and see like when she's saying where some of these modern day practices that are starting to become what's the word some of the practices which like just started as like here's just what this one group does but it's just becoming like trickled down to become like a more common belief or common practice that you'll hear about it's still important like especially with these modern day groups to figure out where exactly is this information coming from just saying you can still read it I'm not going to gatekeep anyone from reading anything. But yeah, let's see. It said uh, during the 80s, the Asatru Free Assembly dissolved and then it was split. And then Edred Thorson and James Chisholm founded the Troth in Texas. Oh, and then in the 90s, McNallan refounded the AFA as the super racist Asachi Folk Assembly. So she does kind of touch on it here briefly in these two pages where she just lists out some of the groups and doesn't really 
go too much into who they are or what they stand for one way or the other. Then there's a whole chapter on the different gods where she just gives brief overviews on some of the main gods. Heimdall. Oh, here's something cool that I underlined. In folklore, the waves are called sheep and the last wave in a sequence is called the ram. The Old Norse word for ram is Heimdali, so the sheep is considered one of his animals. So that's cool. Yeah, one thing I will say about uh, Diana Paxson that I did appreciate about this book is she gives you a lot of like external resources to go to because since this is just kind of a very brief introductory primer, trying to condense a lot of information into one like easy to read introductory book, she does do a good job of at the end of like every chapter giving you a list of like sources and just websites and other places you can go to. Um, the only caveat I will say with that is like as far as like websites or like sample rituals or like things that you can say or do yourself, um, you know, I can't really, I guess, throw too much shade at her for it. But a lot of the links that she will refer you back to are the troths and their own personal links and practices and rights that they've developed. But so if, if that is something that you just want to have to go off of just to use yourself or adopt or adapt and has, have as a basis, she does have those there for you. Then she has Tyr, Odin, has some very good points on Odin, which, yeah, the big one here that I agreed with was, and like I was saying earlier, is like when you end up working for Odin, it's because um, Odin is a god of evolving consciousness. He's very much concerned with the future of the world and how mankind is progressing. So he will take those who dedicate themselves to him and use them as he sacrificed himself for the greater good. And, and there's my note there. It just says, yup. <laughs> so, especially after talking to my poor husband who was recruited as an Odin boy from apparently a very early age. It seems very accurate. And then Thor, Freyr, Njord, even a good little section on Loki here has a fun little chart list of common correspondences for some of the different gods and then a whole chapter on the goddesses. And then this one was cool, ways of devotion. Because Asa true specifically means troth of the Aesir. So, you know, maybe I would be more of a Vana true. I work more with the Vanir. She does make an interesting point here that I highlighted at the beginning of this chapter where she says, perhaps because we um, are a, kind of such a very scattered population having all immigrated over here to North America, um, most North American heathens find it easier to make a strong connection to gods and goddesses than to ancestors or spirits of the land, which might be a good point and maybe a good reason why I am having such a hard time getting into like ancestor connection and ancestor worship is like not only do I just know very little about my family line and family history, just going even back to like grandparents and earlier, but even from what I've been able to find of what's been written and handed down, so much was lost when people immigrated to the United States. They just kind of left that old life behind, took on a whole new name, and left their families, started a whole new family line. And so that, that branch was just kind of broken. And then, yeah, this is not our native land, so definitely maybe be a struggle in, in sometimes and in specific places in particular. There are definitely some land spirits or maybe especially like the ancestral spirits that became tied to places here that that are not friendly and they don't they don't want us there and they don't want anything to do with you and it's 
really best to just uh, accept and honor that and be respectful. Yeah, we're also not generationally passing things like our land on to our children either. So, so yeah, we've lost those roots of where we came from. Yeah, it would be interesting to find if I ever do get to travel to Europe, what the land spirits there would be like. And then, oh, this is, here's a good spark of discussion here. She also does note that um, even within our own groups, heathens may differ in their very ideas about what the gods are. Um, are they spiritual beings who exist in another dimension of reality that intersects our own? There are also those who believe that the gods have a physical existence in another universe from which they contact us. For others, they are culture-specific examples of archetypal figures, like Thor is an aspect of the thunder god, Loki is grouped in with the tricksters, etc. But the good takeaway here that she ends it off with is that the important question is not what the gods are, but whether they will answer when we call on them. And that to me is ultimately what I keep saying, the reason why I'm still on this path more than a year later is honestly because I can't argue with the results. You know, I was into kind of Wicca and witchcraft for a long time and always into mythology and like really into like Egyptian gods in particular for a long time. But anytime I kind of felt like, oh, maybe I should like get a, an idol to Bast or Horus instead of an altar, there was just never any connection there. And when I reached out to the Norse gods, on the other hand, it was like, oh, hey, hi, how you doing? Yep, we're real. What do you want? You need anything? Hey. Yeah, I think it's kind of like I said in my Loki video, Rachel, where the gods will kind of fulfill whatever role you want them to in your life. It's very like Jareth in Labyrinth where he like Sarah's all getting mad at him for taking the baby and making her do all this stuff. And he's like, bitch, you wanted me to like, I am what you made me like, I'm your fantasy. So it's like, if you invite in Loki as the trickster and you think that's all he is, is just going to come fuck your shit up, then yeah, like, that's if that's the only space you make for him in your life, if that's the only space you make for him in your life, then that's the space he'll fill. But yes, he's definitely so much more than that. So yeah, that's that interesting. I'm curious to see, like, what your guys' take is on, like, what are the gods? Do they exist in another dimension that intersects our own? Do they have physical bodies? Did they at one point have physical corporeal forms and interacted with us here on Midgard in this plane? And then my theory is that their Ragnarok is cyclical and the actual like Twilight of the Gods has like already happened and they expended all of their essence basically and all of their power just to preserve what they could after that that they kind of lost a lot of their power and a lot of their energy maybe they even kind of lost a lot of their ability to interact with this plane or lost a corporeal form if they had one but now they're kind of almost like we are reawakening almost like as we're becoming more aware of them they're also coming back and becoming more aware of us and vice versa i don't know equivalent exchange that's all i'm saying yeah i did think it was funny that uh she does say although i have worked successfully with individual deities from a number of other culture i have found that as a group the germanic pantheon is the most alive, well, and eager to party. So yeah, I mean, out of all of the other deities that I thought about or wanted to reach out to, the Norse and the Germanic gods were actually the only ones ever actually give me a response. And the one that I couldn't like really deny or refute or argue with. 
So yeah, they are very like here and, and active and willing to kind of participate as soon as we reach out to them, they become aware of us. And I definitely agree that that whole old Viking concept of having a friendship type relationship with the gods is, is very important and how I would kind of view mine or like how I keep saying it as like a mentor mentee relationship where there's still that level of respect for them as like a teacher. Um, but, but yeah, it's more of an equal exchange. And then, yeah, like I said, the next section goes into offerings and how in the bloat, the offering is made and the people blessed. And then the offering is sent to the gods. And then in return, they reach out to us with their help and love. The process is reciprocal. The other important thing that I always keep telling people and that I think you'll see mentioned a lot in our particular community is, says right here in the Havam all, right there. Tis better to not to pray than to make too many offerings. So it's like, that's definitely one thing I've been trying to keep in mind when I start feeling like I'm slacking or like when I started out and it was all eager beaver, like, oh, I'm going to offer to Odin every Woden's day and Freya every Friday. And girl, no, you got to be able to live our life. And like I said, it's not a religion. It's just a way of living. And so it's better to just give without asking for anything or just to maintain that connection and that relationship than to do it out of a sense of obligation because then they're going to start feeling like, oh man, this guy keeps giving me a lot of shit. What does he want from me? Like, you keep giving me all this stuff. You must want something. Mm -hmm. so it just kind of goes into some of the basic concepts behind offerings, prayer, yeah, friendship with the gods, like our relationships with other humans is maintained by regular communication. You don't really have to give or do anything, but like even as I'm just going throughout my day, I don't, I don't know, I'm weird, I'm a crazy person, I think too much. Um, I can't shut my brain up, so I'm always kind of like hashing out hypothetical scenarios and conversations in my head. Does anyone else do this? Like, either I'll be rethinking something I already talked about with someone, or I'll have something that I want to talk about with someone, and I'll like rehearse the conversation in my head of like, oh, like, what if I said this? Oh, and then what if they said like this thing? And then what, what would I do? What would I say? And I don't know. Is it, is it just me? No, I'm nuts. But now instead of like doing that to like angst over stuff and like do like what if scenarios, I'll do it like I'm talking to Freya. I'll just like chit chat with her in my head like throughout my day. Just be like, oh, hey, yeah, yeah, that was funny. Or did you see when that happened? Or like, bitch, Freya, did you see what that girl just said to me? And was, ooh, Freya, give me the strength, <laughs> you know? Or, like, if I'm just having a shower, I'll, like, talk to her while I'm in the shower. So I'm just thinking about stuff and kind of meditate on her and different things like that. So, yeah, it's, like, very, very like, informal relationship. She's kind of, like, a big supportive older sister just, like, cheering me on that I can just kind of, like, talk to you about stuff throughout my day. <laughs> You guys are funny. So yeah, I think that is definitely important. And like one of the big distinctions between this religion versus like Christianity or modern day organized religions is that you don't need that figurehead or that intermediary to communicate to the gods for you. You can do it yourself anywhere, anytime. And then, yeah, like you don't, you don't even need excuse me, like the altar or the shrine space, um, the details like really aren't important with what you're doing in your daily practice. It's just whatever helps you reach that state of mind in which you can make that connection with the gods, whatever you got to do to get there. And then she talks about altars, setting up an altar space, talks about the concept of the bloat. 
or the sacrifice or the offering, which back in the day would have been animal sacrifices. Bloat comes from, I believe, the word for blood, but we're living in the modern age here. And so I think whatever to you has value and would be considered a sacrifice to give up is an acceptable offering these days. And then, yeah, she does go in depth here with that thing I mentioned at the beginning of the symbol, which the, the three rounds where they everyone goes around and offers praise to a god or goddess of their choice. And then you pass the horn around again. And remember heroes and the beloved dead. And then the third round is an open round in which you may honor the living, including those present. So I would say like, especially for like our community where it's like the big three of like gods, ancestors and like land spirits, there's also like gods, ancestors and the community or the folk. Um, they do kind of is an interesting aspect that I found with the scenarios or like the example rituals that she lays out here is that like not, is not only is there like a symbol leader um, who acts as kind of a master of ceremonies um, in this Anglo-Saxon style, as she called it, there would also be usually a woman designated the Valkyrie who would be fulfilling that role that you will see some of the goddesses themselves fulfilling in the sagas of being the one to present the horn of mead to the heroes or to the guests. And so there would be a chosen person to be the Valkyrie and be the one to carry the horn around to each participant, or each guest may have his or her own horn or goblet. Yeah, I think that would be cool to incorporate into more rituals. But then I can also see where when you get to like a gathering of 30 or more people, you'd be there for like two hours if everyone got time to like make their own individual toasts. So I can kind of see why some of those things have been condensed at some of the larger ones. The other thing I thought was cool that they did note, and which I thought was a good idea for anyone who does not or cannot drink alcohol for things like that, um, if someone's passing a drink around or making toasts, um, instead of taking a drink, you could just kiss the horn or just pour a little out on the ground, pour one out for your homies instead, or by dabbing a drop on their forehead kind of anointing yourself with the drink instead of drinking it. So I thought that was cool. A good idea to keep in mind if you're also someone who doesn't partake, but wants to be a part of these group rituals, which often involve alcohol. And then she briefly goes over some of the more common holy days or big events that you might see celebrated in these communities like the main ones are solstices and equinoxes and then depending on kind of how eclectic or inclusive you are they might also include some of the more minor more celtic calendar derived things like beltane or llamas stuff like that we just got done celebrating Beltane, and then the night before is also Walpurgisnacht. Yeah, I thought that was cool that she made sure to give examples for what you can do if you don't partake in the drinking, but you still want to be a part of things. Well, I also like that she said, May Day is a time to rejoice in the springtide and honor Freya and the Vanir. We were definitely channeling some Freya Vanir vibes at our Beltane getaway, that's for sure. Between people have just letting their Freya energy out and being their best vibrant witchy selves to me dressing up as a literal elf and pretending like I was an Elfheim, <laughs> the Vanir energy was strong. 
Um, then she also has a section on Germanic magic, talking about the different magical concepts that you will see, like Sadir, Gond, Gondor, Galder, or the chanting of magical spells and runes. I thought it was interesting that she does like have very specific breakdowns in here of different types of spells and Galder. Valgalder, waking the dead to learn from them. Grogalder, the conjuration formula to compel a white to answer. Not Galder, night singing to inhibit night walking spirits. Lurlagalder, liltingly song music to lull the target to sleep characterized by rhythm, melody, hummed words, like, and I thought that word also sounded like lullaby. And then need spells to curse or invoke spirits to attack an enemy, often carved on a pole in runes. And then she also does touch upon runes here. Seder, like I said, different divinatory practices. And then the third section is the toasts, boasts, and oaths. Toasts, boasts, and oaths. Try saying that three times fast. I have a whole section paper clipped off here. Let's see what I did that for. Okay, so yeah, she goes into the whole cosmology, Norse creation myth. Weird and Orlog, the concept of fate and the Norns, which is also a big one, and then the different concepts of the afterlife. And then, ooh, okay, here's, here's where we get into some of my hot takes with this book. So get ready, because it's going to get spicy here at the end. I know we've been going for about an hour now, so I'm going to try and wrap it up, but Okay, we're, we're like we're into the last section of the book now, so get with me, because I got some I've got some shit to say about it. Heathen virtues is the section you will see here, also known in the common heathen community. You might come across it as the nine noble virtues. But my note is here be dragons of dubious folkish origin. Heathens seek in the Eddas and Sagos examples and hints as to what a heathen worldview should be and what ethical principles will help us to live in the world. Although the establishment of religious laws or commandments is as foreign to heathenism as it is to any other form of heathen belief, in the Eddas and Sagas, heathens can find examples of how to live. Yeah, that's cool. That's fine. Havamal is a good one that I would that would come to mind. And then, but she says, in the 1980s, the Odinic Rite in England derived from the old lore a set of guidelines known as the Nine Noble Virtues. And like I said, if you go and do a quick little Google search on the Odinic Rite in England, no, bad, no. So, yeah, well, I think you could kind of argue that within things like Germania and the texts and the sagas, you could derive some of these basic ethics and moral concepts as being kind of foundational to their beliefs and their society. Just want you guys to be aware of where the modern day concept of these nine noble virtues actually comes from, okay? Just... Just do just do a little bit of, of your homework, I'm just saying. Like I said, I didn't even do a whole lot of in-depth thing, but just a quick brief Google search on who some of these organizations are can kind of let you know where their beliefs lie. And the Odinic Rite, um, I would not fucks with them, to put it that way. But she does go into the Nine Noble Virtues here and what those are, if you care to know. And then here it has questions and conflicts, talks about UPG versus things that are actually in the lower. Do, 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 what else?
I also thought it was interesting that she does note um, that while most of us, you know, in modern day focus our religious practice on the gods and the goddesses, um, the spiritual ecology of the northern world included a broad spectrum of spiritual beings. Um, and not only like the lesser things, but also like you will find modern day people that do work like do rock a true and worship the Jotun and want to work with the giants and those more primordial like elemental beings. Um, and I like that she does make a point to say that whether they're good or evil just kind of depends on context. Um, and so the Jotunar might just be seen as disasters in which the forces of nature are out of balance. And that's definitely kind of how I see a lot of them and what I see them representing in a lot of cases. Um, and then it, she also does make an interesting note that there are no tales in which the giants interact directly with humans, unless like Scotty, they've been brought into the world of the gods. Um, the gods mediate between us and the world of the giants, but the humans only work directly with the Vaitir, the ones who are kind of like below us in power level or equal, if you want to kind of view it that way. So I thought that was kind of an interesting way of looking at it, and I definitely um, can buy into what she says about um, in Europe and Iceland, um, belief in these beings persisted after the conversion in the form of like elves and the fairy folk. Let's see. And then she makes another note here of saying that, like, yeah, you're going to find modern day groups here that think that this practice should be based on ethnicity or ancestry, but. Um, the great thing about modern day practice is that we do have so much more information available to us from many different practices and religions. And also that it's kind of our job to be inclusive uh, the way I see it and select, um, as she puts it, the best from an older culture and reinterpret it in ways that will work in a new environment. Like, so that's why I kind of don't, drive so much with like the more strictly like historical reconstructionist like heathen the way some people on like the internet community seem to view the term as being like more strictly based on like what we know of historical practice but yeah i kind of want to keep it more open and more fluid to incorporating modern day interpretations and information and that, yeah, um, when it comes to the matter of like religious practice, the configuration of our bodies is far less important than that of our minds and souls. When I meet someone who reads the same books, does the same rites, and honors the same gods as I do, it is the meeting of minds that identifies them to me as spiritual kin. And I think that's definitely an important tenet of the practice for me is it's like, especially like meeting with fellow Norse pagans and people that like do want to follow the Havamal and things like that. And like those tenets of like how to be a good person and act in society. I think that is really important to have that basis when you're meeting with new people that you've never met in person before or only met online having that reasonable guarantee that like we're all of relatively a like mind when it comes into like these are our basic beliefs in common human decency <laughs> yeah i didn't choose for odin to show up did and did anyone really Um, she does kind of have a passage here on like some of the differences between modern day Asatru and Wicca, because like I said, I did kind of find some similarities in just the more structured aspects of the uh, specifically like Asatru traditions and groups, just because they've been around, you know, since the 70s and 80s at this point. So they've just had time to kind of develop and hone these things and start incorporating them and like setting them down as like this is our practice so what i think can be both good and bad
And then the last chapter is just called From Hearth to Hoff, Heathen Organizations. So it just kind of has a brief overview of more, more modern day Norse pagan groups and practices. Well, because like I said, I think this book primarily is a good introduction and primer to some of the basic tenets, rituals, and practices that you might find if you were going to an organized heathen kindred or like that type of group and some of the more organized group rituals that they might have and what you could expect from them. And just, yeah, some good basics of like, well, who are these people? Like, what do they believe in? Who, like, what gods do you worship? So it's definitely a really good introduction on all of these different basic concepts. I like that she says, when I first encountered Asa True in the 1960s, the typical follower of the Norse gods was a young single man whose ideas about the religion had been formed by reading Conan the Barbarian and Lord of the Rings. Is it really that different nowadays? With We still have Lord of the Rings, and then I know Vikings was really big for the whole resurgence in Norse paganism and interest in the Odin and those gods. Or, yeah, what I do like to kind of jokingly refer to as Brosatru. And then, yeah, she also mentions again Stephen McNallan, founder of Asatru Folk Assembly which I really wish she was not name dropping him in here like that because she's just like, yeah, he said that books and movies led to his discovery of the Norse gods back then. So I think, yeah, it is interesting that you will kind of still encounter that stereotype today of a heathen as being that gung-ho warrior type. But I think it's been nice, like the longer some of these communities have been around and are growing, the, the balance is starting to get there. Some of them can be a little bit of a sausage fest, not going to lie, so, but, but yeah, I think we're starting to find a lot more women or feminine inclined peoples developing an interest, not in just like witchcraft or Wicca, but like the Norse gods specifically, and that there is a lot here for us ladies, and that's kind of one of the major things that I wanted to provide here on this channel was like a less masculine lens to view this religious practice from. Yes, Runa, it's important for channels like ours because it is still kind of a very male-dominated space for now. And then I've also heard on the flip side, surprisingly, that a lot of men coming into the spirituality found like Wicca or like the witch talk groups to be very like almost oh, not the because misogyny is woman hating misandrist, like just not very welcoming of men, which I, and I don't blame them for. Like I know Wicca and witchcraft and like witchcraft versus patriarchy was a big thing that drew me into the faith. So I could see why you could like be a guy finding some groups that just aren't very like into having dudes invading their space. And you will find a lot of like Wicca that is very goddess worship predominant. So it's important to have that balance on both ends of the spectrum. So yeah, she just kind of goes into more like of what you might find as a uh, as in terms of the the structure of some modern day organizations and where some of their traditions might come from. Um, but yeah, the big bone that I really just kind of had to pick with this group or with this book is that I just kind of wish she had addressed that elephant in the room more, especially in this section when she's talking about modern day heathen organizations and like, where some of them originated from. Um, like I kind of get why you don't want to go in air the dirty laundry out about some of these groups, and it's just more to provide information on how it's laid out in general. 
but but yeah, she just kind of, she name drops some groups in here, which I get this was written, I guess, like back in 2006, but I know it's been updated and republished since then. So I just wish maybe she had gone back now that it's been like 20 something years and so much has kind of, I think, happened, especially nowadays with the political spectrum in our society and how so many folkish groups are also glomming onto that and co-opting the religion for their agendas. I just wish she had touched on it more of like the Asachu Folk Assembly and the folkish groups that are still out there. Um, because she says, um, what, what does she say? She says, In terms of traditions, the, because the bulk of surviving information comes from the old Norse Eddas and sagas, most Asatru kindreds base their practice primarily on this lore and call the gods by their old Norse names, using Norse terminology and focusing on the myths set down in those Eddas. And then fucking name drop Stephen McNallan again. And then in parentheses, it says, see the discussion on the AFA later in this chapter but this is the last chapter in the book and nowhere in this chapter did i find a more in-depth discussion on stephen mcnallan and the afa so why is that in there at all if you're not actually going to talk about it i'm just really confused like did i miss something because He's one of the folkish ones. And so, yeah, she's like name dropping him and just, I guess, letting us know that like, hey, some of these traditions and these terms that you're going to see used, this is where they're coming from. They're coming from, this is the guy that made it up. Um, and then, yeah, it says, see the discussion on the AFA later in this chapters, um, just because, yeah, the, the their rituals, they were one of the first groups to exist. Their rituals were among some of the first to be published. And so they had a great influence on people who followed after them. And then, but yeah, she had that in parentheses of C discussion on, on those groups later in this chapter on page 165. And then I couldn't actually find anywhere in the end of this book where she actually talks about it. So like, yeah, it, it goes on to, like she says, she says that on page 165 and then talks about finding a kindred, heathen clergy, like priests and priestesses, um, and talks about finding other heathens online um, and then surviving your first heathen event. Just, yeah, what to expect at your first gathering. And then list of resources so i kind of had a little bone to pick with diana paxson over that one like i get if you don't want to go too in depth into that or if you just kind of want to say like hey yeah just be aware that these groups are out there do your own research we can kind of point you in the direction of like who you might want to steer clear from but yeah like she name drops these people and kind of like tiptoes around the fact that like some of these groups are folkish and what that means but she doesn't ever really directly address it or talk about it which for a book on like essential asatru like i said that's it's kind of the elephant in the room and from someone who is the leader of the troth like one of the big name organized recognized groups still going nowadays i just kind of wish that she had addressed it more especially just kind of from what i the little that i had found on wikipedia and knowing that her group had been like a splinter group from that one originally yeah, it could be, could be fear of retaliation. Who knows? I, I guess it's like, yeah, I can see why you won't, don't want to go too in depth with the name calling and the accusations. But yeah, if you're actually going to say like, see discussion later in this chapter, I want to see some discussion later in the chapter. But 
that that was really the only big issue that I kind of had with this book. And that's just kind of the issue that you have to be aware of with, I would think, with, I would say, any book on, on Norse religion and Norse paganism, especially modern day practices, is just here there be dragons. You, you might start reading a book and then they might name drop a guy that you're like, hey, I know that guy's name and I don't like that guy and I don't agree with what he believes in. Why are you citing him? But but yeah, sadly, it's kind of like Wicca, where some of these groups were the first groups to kind of really develop some of these traditions and these concepts. And now it's been filtered through and watered down and separated from the source and just put out on the interwebs, um, cited for anyone to pick up and digest. So just do your just do your research if you come across a name or an organization and you haven't heard of them and you don't know what they stand for or what they represent like i said just do some google search and that's what i did if i, I don't like my what she would say like oh this came from the odinist society and be like oh what's the odinist society and that's all you got to do i usually don't really even carry it any further than that i'll admit it because yeah like i'm just kind of digesting information and reading books um I try to, like when I first got into this faith, like would kind of research the author's name before I spent money on a book just to see if it was someone I wanted to give my money to or not. But we all we don't have time or wherewithal or mental capacity to do that with everything all the time. So just use your own critical thinking, use your own rational judgment with, with everything. Even, even with this, just always be aware always be aware of your sources because like I said, as much as I love all of the extra information and like sources and links and resources that she provides in this book, like I said, she gives you at the end of each chapter, like here's where you can go if, if you want to know more about Tyr or Thor or you want some like example poems or ritual prayers that you can use check out this website. Um, but then the website would be like, check out the Troth website. And so some of, so some of her sources were like a little self-referential where they would be like, check out our e-zine guys. If you want to know more about this concept, check out our, check out this edition of our e-zine. So as a, someone who is kind of like coming at it from like that English major scholarly approach where it's like, no, you need to cite seven different sources to support your claim. <laughs> then I'm like, stop referring to yourself as a source. But it is what it is. I do think she is a, a fairly good and um, accurate, informative and reliable source of information, especially for people who are just getting into the faith. And like I said, I was a huge fan of her fiction works before I even learned that she was actually a practicing member of a pagan organization. So that was just like a really cool coincidence. Mm, coincidence or was it? Yes, English majors for life. I mean, you saw my book. I can't help it. I underline, I highlight. As much as part of me still thinks it's like blasphemous to desecrate my book like that, I can't help it. Well, and it just, it helps me for things like this with the discussions, because especially, like I said, I finished this book like pretty quickly and had a couple like a week or two before the end of the month when I actually sat down to talk about it with you guys and then a lot of stuff going on in between now and then so it's definitely kind of helpful for me when I actually come to sit down and do these live streams and talk about it with people to be like what were some of the things that I actually did want to make note to bring up and some points that I had so but overall I would say yeah if you're someone that just really wants a brief primer on the history of the Viking and Scandinavian peoples, their traditions, their beliefs, a nice little brief overview on some of the more common gods and some of the more common practices that you might find at a modern modern day heathen or pagan community. Some of the stuff described about like the gatherings and the rituals definitely felt and sounded familiar to some to me who had been to several of the Wisdom of Odin gatherings and then also like the heathen coven retreats. But it's nice that 
that I kind of like a little bit more of an informal structure. So I the, one of the things that kind of made me steer clear of Wicca was just kind of having that like priest and priestess class and I think she was even describing like a more Anglo-Saxon form of heathenry where you pledge your fealty to a lord and almost like the priest and priestess class you have to like start as an initiate and work your way up through the ranks like you're a fucking Freemason like what is this but like I'm not into that kind of mystery cult man I'm here to digest and then regurgitate all the information with you fine people, not lock it up. Keep it behind a fake title you made up for clout. So, yeah, I think that's definitely just the important distinction to make with this religion and that she does also make a point of saying in this book is that you don't, need a formal religious organization. You don't need an altar. You don't need to get together with a group to worship these gods or do any of this stuff. There's, Like I said, it's more of a lifestyle than a religion. It's just an everyday way of living. And so that's just kind of what I've tried to keep in mind as I'm developing my own personal practice or like a daily practice because... I don't know if I have what you would call like a formal daily practice. I don't always have the time or like the remember to go up to the altar every day. But but yeah, I do kind of have those little chit chat, light hearted, con- informal conversations with my homegirl Freya in my mind as I'm just going about my day, you know, just touching base with them. Um, and I think just kind of seeing them as that presence and that part of your everyday life, kind of like what I talked about in my review of the Northmen, where that's kind of what they were trying to set up as a setting for the movie and with the style that they were trying to tell the story with is that these gods and this belief and this animistic way of thinking is is not really a religion it's just a way of being and of interacting with the world around you like the land spirits are here and present in our world whether we can see or want to acknowledge them or not so Yeah, that's definitely one of my goals this year, Rachel, is to try and develop more of like a daily practice, especially where meditation is concerned. Like I definitely learned that I have ADD brain for sure. So it's really hard for me to sit and try to just not think because again, like brain no shut off. But I think that's definitely an important part of my practice is to not only start making a habit of setting more time aside to be present for and with the gods, but also for and with myself. So, so yeah, um, I actually was gifted a beautiful set of Freya prayer beads, like a mala, um, which my goal is to use during meditation sessions because that's kind of like my goal that I'm setting for myself right now as a way to try to get into it and make myself sit still for long enough to hopefully accomplish something is can I at least make myself sit still in front of this altar for the length of time it takes for an incense stick to burn down or I can at least sit and be present as I'm like counting each bead on this prayer mala and saying little prayers and devotions to Freya, at least set aside that amount of time and just see if I can work my way up from there. Oh man, I think I think we could all use some yoga in our life. That was like, I'm not an athletic person by any means. I never really have been, always been like kind of a nerdy bookworm. Um, and so, yeah, like, long periods of exertion is not my thing, but I love yoga. Oh man, like I did get to take a couple classes here a few years back and like I just love it because it's so good just for stretching and it's meant to, you know, not only teach you to move your body, but also to teach and direct your energy. And so 
it's just kind of a really nice low impact workout for people like me that aren't good at like high cardio or like physically exertive things like lifting weights but because yeah like you don't really feel like you're doing a whole lot when you're into it it's like oh I'm just doing some stretches this feels good and then by the time you're done I'm like why do I hurt all over I actually did something in there all right guys I'm gonna wrap this up man it's Sunday night already I gotta I'm gonna try not to think about how I have to go to work tomorrow for the rest of the evening, but yeah, the intellectual part, but the practice part is challenging. I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, I, I guess, was kind of like lucky enough, if you want to put it that way, that I wasn't raised religious at all. So I had like nothing, I have like nothing to kind of get over in that sense as far as like overcoming dogma that was instilled in me since childhood, but I'm still like, I also have just nothing to go off of in terms of like, what is it like to have any form of daily practice? What is it even like to have faith? Like I labeled myself agnostic before I found the God. So I'm still really even struggling with that whole concept in general of like believing in gods and yeah praying i'm like am i like am i really over here telling people i'm gonna like pray to gods for them and it works but i like because it does work like i said i can't argue with the results but i'm still kind of over here like am i really doing this have i lost my damn mind so, and then, yeah, just also being a bookworm, I'm a, also just a big one for sitting and reading and reading and reading, and I want to do all the research and have all the information and be super well-informed as I can be before I even go to start doing anything, but I need to, to stop with the reading and the learning and start with the doing. I need to get more into, like, the actual hands-on personal practice, so that is definitely my struggle and my goal for this year as well. And a big reason why I also wanted to start this channel is just so I could kind of document what I'm learning, what I'm doing, what's working, what's not working, and kind of share that journey with you guys. So I've found myself kind of falling more into that category of like informative videos where I'm just kind of talking to you about stuff that I'm interested in and like have been reading and researching. But yeah, I'm definitely going to be trying to, as I develop my own personal practice, try to work in ways of organically sharing that with people, because it is kind of a struggle to maintain that balance of like, I want to share stuff with people, but I don't want YouTube to feel like a chore or like it's taking too much time out of me just living my day to day life. So or that like I'm doing stuff just for YouTube or just for Instagram. So, so yeah, if it's kind of like happening organically that I'm doing something and it's convenient to like film it and make video and put it in a video, that's what I'm doing. But, but yeah, it's been a struggle to kind of find that balance for sure. I think that would definitely be a good idea to have more books on personal practice because there are kind of nice things like this. Like this book actually, um, if I had one thing to compare it to, it reminded me a lot of Visions of Vanaheim, which I read, which was kind of a primer to the Vanir gods and did a really good job of kind of recapping like the history and like the um, historical and anthropological side of things. And then going into not only like what we knew from the lore, of the Vanir gods, but also incorporating a lot of people's own UPG and personal practice regarding each god. And I'm like kind of, I'm all for it. Like I said, some people are really coming at this religion from more of like a purely like reconstructionist standpoint. Um, and but I, I, I love hearing people's UPGs and matching it up with my own and seeing like where things are almost like converging and matching up to the point that they're becoming VPG or verified personal noses across many peoples and groups. And so I, I love seeing that kind of stuff. 
And, and yeah, I think it's just really helpful when so much of it was underground and not acceptable when pushed away by Christianity for so long um, and kind of taboo to share with. Like, I can see where some people have the mindset of, like, oh, no, like, you shouldn't be sharing your personal religious practice on a camera for everybody because it's not, then it's not special. You're taking away from it. But I think it's also important to, like, share personally, like, what we're doing and what we're trying. And especially, like, not to just have it be that, like, cookie cutter um, social media image of perfection where we're only showing you like, oh, here's what I've learned. Here's what I know. I also want to show you like, here's what I've tried. I'm just going to fuck around and find out and see, like, especially with the whole witchcraft side of things. Like, I'm kind of afraid to delve into more of like the witchcrafts and spell work practice of things because I feel like I haven't read enough. I don't know what I'm doing, but I think sometimes you just got to fuck around and find out. Yeah, I think exactly. Our, our our world is different now, and we can't. Not only should we not be looking at the past through our own modern his, like modern day lens of like how we're viewing our own society and trying to copy paste it on the past, it's also important not to take the past and try to copy paste it on the modern day society. So yeah, I'm gonna be trying to have more of a balance in between like informative research videos and stuff that I'm like learning and wanna talk about re like the mythology and like comparative mythology especially, cause that is definitely something that I am into and wanna nerd out about all the time. But yeah, also sharing my, developing my own personal practice with you guys. But as far as developing a personal practice, if you do like really want a good primer of some things that you can, take away into Norse paganism specifically, I, I would recommend this book. I think it does a really good job of condensing a lot of basic introductory information into one quick little digestible format here. Because like I said, I found this book a lot easier to absorb and get through than her Odin book. I feel like I still am gonna have to go back and reread that one to get all of what I missed the first time. But on that note, I think I'm gonna leave this one off there. I'm really glad you guys all came to join me for this one because I did like really have a lot to say and like some actual opinions about this rather than just like kind of summarizing what I read about in it. So so yeah, I'm really glad that you guys tuned in for this one, especially when it was kind of so last minute on my part with the announcements and with the remembering to do it. So I was like saying to Miguel, I was like, shit, I haven't even showered. I'm just going to have to throw my hair up in a bun and go for it. So, so yeah, I really enjoy having you guys all here to talk about this with me and look for the poll to be coming up online here soon probably by the end of this week so we can pick out a book to read for next month for for this month I guess because we're already in May holy cow but until next time stay classy pagans